Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve sallallahu ve sellem ve baraka ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecma'in. Allahümme allimna ma yenfa'una ve anfa'na bima allamtana. Ve zidna ilman ve amelan mutakabbalan ya arhamar rahimin. Allahümme la sahla illa ma ce'altehu sahla. Ve ente ya hayu ya qiyyub. Tec'alu l-hazna iza şi'te sahlan sahla. La ilahe illa ente nestagfiruka Allahümme ve netubu ileyk. Ve sallallahu ve sellem ve baraka ala seyyidina Muhammedin. وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to our fourth lesson on the مقدمات of إمام السنوسي رحمه الله تعالى ورضي عنه ونفعنا به وبكم آمين may Allah bless him and protect him and uh, have mercy upon him and benefit us through him uh, this text is on the preliminary precursor discussions regarding beliefs, terminologies and so forth um, last time we looked into the madahib of fil of, af'al, like what are the schools of thought regarding human action, the jabriya, the qadariya, and the ahl sunnah, and then also we talked about the kasb, how one acquires uh, an action, and we talked about the categories of polytheism, the types of shirk, shirk al istiqlal, shirk al tabaid, the shirk of independence, believing there's two gods or, or more, a belief of God being made up of several parts, tabaid, shirk of taqarrub. Worshipping others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking they can get you closer to Allah um, and other forms of shirk as well. One of which was shirk of aghrad, which is when you worship with insincerity. You have another purpose behind your worship. And this is ostentation. This is a riya. There was a question regarding this. Is ostentation shirk al aghrad? Yes, exactly that. It's got different names. Riya, shirk al asghar, shirk al khafi, shirk, the minor shirk, the hidden shirk. And we said this category of shirk is actually, um, if we move on to the PDF, there on the PDF at the top, it actually says that the ruling of the fifth is detailed. Um, so the ruling of the sixth, if we go back slightly on the PDF, excuse me. Uh, the ruling of the sixth is disobedient, disobedience, uh, not kufr. The sixth one being the polytheme of purposes um, by consensus. So it's a sin, it's a disease of the heart, it's called riya, it's called ostentation, it's called showing off. That is correct. And then we talked also about the concept of cusp and actions and uh, applying or giving customary causes, effect, cause and effect being applied to that. Um, so we now move on to the foundations of disbelief and innovation, which are seven, as it says there. We'll read the Arabic as normal and then we'll uh, commence with the English. So um, as we can see here, Anwa'u shirki ستة قال المؤلف رحمه الله تعالى وأنواع الشرك ست uh, excuse me um, let's move on to the أصول الكفر والبدع which is after this right uh, yeah so that's it at the bottom here and you should have now received um, a PDF with um, the full English translation as well إن شاء الله تعالى um, so hopefully you can refer to that so, Wasul Kufri will be the the foundations, the underlying causes, if you like, of disbelief and um, innovation are seven. Number one, Al Ijab with Dati, Wahu Isnadul Kainati, Ilallahi Ta'ala, Allah Sibidi Ta'alili, Awi Tobi, O Gayri Min Gayri Tiarin. And then the PDF seems to have decided not to be uh, correct there. So, I'll read from the hard copy which I've got and we can leave the Arabic for this section from your screens and just go to the English but in terms of the Arabic I'll just read through it all so Ijab al-Zati was the first one um, which is Isnadul Kainati ilallah ta'ala ala sibili ta'lili aw ittaba' min gari ikhtiyarin and the second one is wa tahsin al-aqli on your screens as uh, rationalizing the concept of goodness um, وَهُوَ كَوْنُ أَفْعَالِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَحْكَى مِهِ مَوْقُوفَةً أَقْلًا عَلَى الْأَغْرَاضِ وَهِيَ جَلْبُ الْمَصَالِحِ وَدَرْءُ الْمَفَاسِدِ That's number two. وَالتَّقْلِيدُ الرَّدِي is number three. Um, unworthy imitation or lowly, base imitation, bad imitation, following. وَهُوَ مُتَابَعَةُ الْغَيْرِ لِأَجْلِ الْحَمِيَّةِ وَالتَّعَصُّبْ مِنْ غَيْرِ طَالَبٍ لِلْحَقِّ Number four, وَالْرَبْطُ الْعَادِي which we talked about extensively already but it is uh, the concept of thinking a customary cause is actually a 
logical, rational concept. وثبوت التلازم بين أمر وأمر وجودا أو عدما بواسطة التكرر um, which we're going to explain and then it says number five which on your screens is compound ignorance that's الجهل المركب وهو أن يجهل الحق ويجهل جهله به right so double right, compound right double ignorance والتمسك uh, في أقائد الإيمان is number six والتمسك بأقائد الإيمان أو في أقائد الإيمان بمجرد ظواهر الكتاب والسنة so sticking to the outer and not even looking at it from a rational perspective and then making these inconceivable uh, or taking on inconceivable illogical ideas and concepts as beliefs uh, من غير تفصيل بين ما يستحيل ظاهر ومنها وما لا يستحيل right? what is impossible what is conceivable and you know and mixing that all up and not looking at that at all to be honest والجهل نمبر 7 والجهل بالقواعد الأقلية التي هي العلم بوجوب الواجبات وجوائز الجائزات وباستحالة المستحيلات and the seventh one is to have a ignorance of the foundations or rational uh, foundations or principles it says here ignorance at the bottom there it says if I can get it up ignorance regarding rational principles uh, which are the ones we've talked about the rational ruling and there is something else mentioned here it says وباللسان العربي so this can be part of the um, the seventh one is mentioned as the seventh, but it's kind of separate in a sense. الذي هو علم اللغة والإعراب والبيان. So not knowing language properly and obviously misinterpreting or misunderstanding due to a uh, shortcoming in the Arabic language in particular here, obviously, uh, the sciences of language, um, syntax, and rhetoric, rhetoric, right? Um, so that's the Arabic, um, and let's now go to the English, which is already on your screens. Um, inshallah ta'ala. And we'll talk about these five or seven, sorry, um, foundations of disbelief and innovation. So number one, ijab uh, al-dhati. Okay, so what is ijab al-dhati? Well, first of all, one of these seven foundations underlie or are the cause of all forms of kufr. So Imam Sunusi looked at everything and by, you know, research and investigation broke it down to everything more or less will fall back into one of these seven causes. Um, some will result in kufr, and as it's mentioned in the initial point there, some will result in bid'ah or innovation, um, which means, and we're talking about beliefs here, right? Not actions, right? This is precursor to uh, aqidah. So we're talking about how people make up false beliefs or commit kufr as blasphemy, as we call it. And we look at how people make incorrect beliefs or develop incorrect ideas and then uh, start affirming them and then start believing in them and how that develops uh, based on these seven root causes if you like um, the first one is il ijab al-dhati which is translated there as the necessity of being which doesn't make, mean much unless you explain it um, and what it actually means ijab al-dhati but that's not a really, really good translation the necessity of being um, dhati ijab means to actually enforce something to actually carry out something or make something happen, ijab, to make something wajib, to make something necessary, to make something uh, occur. That has to be the case, right? Ijab, uh, from necessary. Adhati means that it's in and of itself. It's, there's nobody choosing what to do. It's adhati, it's not ikhtiyari, right? It's not by choice, it's by force in a sense. So that's what it refers to. The explanation there is, this is to attribute creation to Allah. So Allah created things, right? Allah, the creation of Allah is the creation of Allah by way of agency, or by natural disposition without a choice for Allah, without a decision for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a foundation of kufr, this leads to kufr. Why? We talked about this, it's the same as, or it's connected to the customary ruling. Um, or that's coming next, it's connected to it in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, didn't have a cause and effect. He had, he was just, the, you know, he, he was just a part of it by force. Uh, and what that means, and what, what this is referring to in particular, and we've touched on this before, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the cause of the existence of the universe, everything that exists, and the universe in particular, the initiation of the universe, he's the cause of it, but not by way of choice, without any decision, without the will of Allah, it was the by default, right? Illa, ta'lil, by default, Allah, Allah is existent, and the universe exists. The hand moves, the ring on the hand will move. You can't, hands haven't got a choice, right? Um, Allah existed, he didn't have a choice. The, the, the world existed with him, part of 
him being existent is the world it just exists there, there, is, there is this belief that that's how the answer is and this is a you know a false belief you know um there's two ways that this can happen by agency or natural disposition previously had for agency a mechanical cause if you remember which is the ta'lil or illa there's a, allah is the illa and the the universe is the ma'lul and the illa and the ma'lul never separate so it's the ring and the the finger is the the illa is the cause and the ma'lul is the effect that comes from it the mechanical outcome which is the movement of the ring right so allah is the illa in we don't say that of course allah is not the the uh, the um, mechanical cause or the, the agency without a choice right that because he's existent there has to be a universe with him because you move your hand the ring has to move you can't stop that from happening Allah exists he has to have a universe with him no Allah exists and he is and he will be and he was and never was not that doesn't mean there's a universe with him he decided at some point well actually no point there was no time for Allah he decided to create and then created time place and a universe right so there's no time for Allah which is not a concept we can comprehend in our human minds, limited minds, but for Allah there's a concept of no time and no place. For the creation it's all time and place and he decided to make that for creation and it all for us commenced, right? So there's a commencement for us, I suppose. Um, they don't, the philosophers, this is referring to or some, of the, some of those people who held this belief that Allah is just, a, just he has to have a universe if he exists. Uh, he's the cause and effect, automatic cause and effect if you like. Um, nobody has a say in it, it just is which is basically fleeing from believing in God creating a universe and saying look it just is basically isn't it and this results in a problem which is the called the pre-eternalness of the of the world because if God is pre-eternal and he is the mechanical cause of something the ring and the finger don't separate so that means that the world the universe has to be pre-eternal and this was a problem Qidamul Alam that some for many philosophers had actually or, you know it's part of the, their thought but also some muslim philosophers fell into this as well or muslim thinkers and scholars right so it's, it's, it's a dangerous one right um to think that uh, the qidam of the alam is something that is possible no it's not uh, the alam is the the qidam in the pre-eternalness right the alam the world is the universe is temporal contingent transient was not existent became existent has no link to being pre-eternal and so forth right um, which is which is clear in our beliefs, right? Unfortunately, there are some you find some discourse that might suggest otherwise. Be aware, and this is why we're learning this, right? This is uh, it's straightforward, but it should be something that we all know that we don't believe in a pre-eternal universe. That's ridiculous, right? It's not. It's illogical, first of all. This whole concept that why is God the ma'lul? He takes away ikhtiyar of Allah. So for us, if you just look at the Quran, right? We don't, if, as Muslims, Allah says, وَرَبُّكُ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ your, your, your Lord creates what He wills. And what he chooses, right? So, okay, this idea of Allah being the mechanical cause negates the ayah of the Quran. Khalas, there you go. We can't negate ayah of the Quran. A clear cut, straightforward ayah of the Quran. Therefore, the concept of illa and ma'lul for Allah of being a cause and effect without choice for Allah is impossible, inconceivable, and it leads to kufr by denying the Quran, by denying our beliefs, by denying rational thought as well. Because rationally, you can't really have God can't be God if He's not deciding things, right? If it's just forced upon Him, right? that's not a concept of divine or divinity um, or the divine being uh, also to mention it says that the natural disposition that's the same as the illa but all, the, all that it means is that there were more stages so they, what they call that is tabi'a natural disposition meaning it was the nature within Allah not his, not his power and his will but it was the nature the natural disposition which is not the case I was done with tabi'a you can't apply a nature to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all Allah is Allah all powerful and he has attributes no nature okay the word isn't really correct for Allah if you use it in a way that's you know just as a normal word is maybe excusable i suppose but using it in this actual term as you know it's by his nature not by his decision he's forced to basically to carry out then what that implies is with, with natural disposition it implies that conditions have to be met and preventive factors have to be removed so the pre prerequisites have to be there like fire burning has to have a piece of it has to touch you can't just burn something from a mile away and there has to be a lack of moisture or you know if you try to burn something that's wet like water it's not going to really burn it's going to heat up and evaporate and you won't feel burning you other things will happen i suppose but the condition of burning and a fire and that effect requires certain conditions some people or that or this is a kind of a explanation some might give that uh, god has to create without a choice if the conditions were met for creation and they were met until xyz right so they start trying to add this idea that god again doesn't have a choice to create there's a natural creation process that just is a part of god 
and he doesn't choose to create so he doesn't so he's not uh, by choice a creator again a problem but it's just adding a stage to the previous one by adding in prerequisites and taking away any preventive factors to there being creation no that's not the case right so we don't believe in that that's a form of kufr and disbelief um and completely completely wrong the second um element here is rationalizing the concept of goodness this is known as a tahseen wa taqbih al aqli yain or aqliyan to regard something as beautiful to classify something as ugly bad by the aql by rational judgment which can't be done by the way which is always going to be subjective some people you know um like some of you might like uh, sour gourd karele yeah some of you might like um peanut butter like marmite somebody else might be like oh that's sickly that i can't even bring myself to become near those things i can't swallow them i can't touch them i feel horrible around them that's personal preference as human it's not a rational it's not a rational um decision right it's a personal decision subjective as they say like subjective from person to person and you can have your opinion therefore it is a subjective thing these are subjective things so when it comes to um regarding something as beautiful or something as ugly like is prayer beautiful or ugly is you know we don't decide you know we might have our opinions regarding certain things it's allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that tells us where there's revelation that tells us fine where there isn't we go by the sharia rules we, we put sharia into it we don't just do a pure rational kind of approach to things right so the um the mu'tazilites they were the ones that fell into this problem they said no 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 there has to be this concept of good that we see as good that god does then right so they kind of almost imposed on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the concept of of doing uh good things right and from this they they came up with um a sort of innovation um which was um the concept of muraatu as salahi wal aslah that allah has to re- take into regard and consider the salah was good or better for a person and you can't do bad things and stuff like this so again this idea of allah doesn't create evil they, they, they went down that road he only does good and gives good to his servants or prevents harm from them and evil from them, which is mentioned in the explanation this is to regard the actions of allah and it's to be logically dependent upon purposes right on you know achieving a good purpose being achieving something good right these are either bringing forth benefits or removal and prevention of harms everything he does has to be like that because Allah he does good therefore he has to do this and what is good but what we decide what we rationalize into being uh, good um but that's not the case right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the revelation tells us what's right and wrong I mean, that this is what we need to actually understand one of the main things about Islamic education is to truly know what is right and wrong and from our Islamic revelation rational perspective because Islam takes everything it takes the rational it takes the revelation and it produces the best tradition the most i mean i'm a muslim so i'm going to say that but i genuinely uh, would put you know let's debate that as well let's you know i'm sure muslim scholars have debated that in the past and presented the arguments for why islam is the best model and the most correct and the correct model not most correct this the correct one um meaning that others have some correctness to them yes they do you know we believe that that some traditions uh, were based on truth and have truth in them um but they're not fully the truth anymore so they're not valid and only valid form of uh belief in allah that will be accepted is islam in the in the in the deen in the islam the religion with allah is but islam uh allah says allah will not accept any other than islam uh, deena right so he won't accept is accept islam as a way of life as a way of submission to him um that doesn't mean go around calling people you know uh uh infidels and you know they're not they're worthy and so forth we, we guide them we, we we live with them and you know allah is going to take them to account not us um but coming back to this point yeah we don't rationalize things we take in the tradition and we balance between you know being literal and you know using the intellect alone and give or giving one the absolute dominance over the other i mean think about it it takes the intellect to first of all submit to allah you have to go through rational decisions but then you have to kind of have the leap of faith because many people know it's right but they don't have the leap of faith to accept it so our rational proofs might prove god exists or might prove this is right but you still have a leap of faith to then accept that otherwise you're in denial that's for what kufr is you might even know the truth but deny it or not accept it and, and reject it right this is what kufr is it's a rejection of the truth um even when one may actually feel inside actually that's the right thing to do i'm just not going to do it i'm not going to submit that's kufr that's disbelief rejection of faith um so then the third one 
um, as you've got there is unworthy imitation. At-taqlid al radi So taqlid is why is unworthy imitation? Because there is worthy imitation as well. There is good uh, imitation. You've got it there, sorry. Um, uh, unworthy imitation. This is to follow someone else for the sake of fanaticism and bigotry whilst not seeking the truth, right? So this is to just become fanatical and zealous and just follow a person or a group or a think group thinking right this is these are forms of misguidance and illogical um, uh, statements beliefs outcomes and you know fallacies being produced by you just follow the group i've got to follow the group i've got to follow them i've got to follow them um and this could lead to absolute kufr as well right it could, lead, it could lead to so this one leads to everything it could lead to bid'ah it could lead to kufr it could lead to being on the right path as well uh, but if it's unworthy imitation then it's only the bad path right no, you know it's not going to lead to any good if it's unworthy imitation because in unworthy imitation you're not after the truth as it says there uh, while not while it's not seeking the truth what you're after is um just to follow your forefathers people have this even in islam people follow their school of thought follow their um, they have this ta'assub ta'assub is this like, type of um bigotry and fanaticism uh and partisanship and you know kind of wanting nothing but my way or the highway kind of thing right without even looking at what's right and wrong, without being objective, without being, you know, objective and thinking about things and saying, like, what does God say? What does Allah say? We've we got to follow the Quran. What does the Prophet say? We've got to follow the Sunnah. What do the ulama say? And again, you know, be fanatical towards the alim or a group of ulama can result in this kind of negative following. Uh, can, depending on who you follow, of course. Um, and by saying, and this is for others, so why is, uh, you know, why do disbelievers disbelieve or they don't come away from their beliefs, where like Christians remain firm, you know, staunch Christians and so forth because of this following which keeps them away from the truth right um, whether it's Christians or any other religion right um, that's a problem right why do people believe in that God is in a space or time or a shape or size or has a body or is you not know, why are they anthropomorphic in their beliefs because they follow people and they adhere to them and they don't want to leave that tradition because they are blindly following it and they might, they're following you know number uh, five we're going to talk about that the uh, people who take things literally and don't rationally look at things at all um, so they follow they're following those people or they are those people right um, the third one um, or sorry the fourth one is also just to mention there is good following as well so unworthy imitation no there's good following what's good following following in terms of your fake rulings like we can't all become scholars and figure out what's halal and haram and how to pray and fast what it says in the Quran what it says in the hadith and of us who have not read the Quran or the Hadith in our lives, right? the meanings of them. We just follow what the rulings are, which are derived by qualified scholars, ulama, who derive for us the rulings of Islam and um, and, and teach us that and, and so forth. So we follow them, alhamdulillah, and we respect them. And that's a good following right, of great scholars, of not just one scholar, but a group of scholars in our worship, our fatawa come from these scholars. So that's called uh, taqlid as well. It's called following, imitating without knowing why or understanding why fully. And there's levels of that following as well. Some understand a lot, some understand less. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter as long as you follow uh, the four schools of Sunni uh, 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 jurisprudence: the Hanafi Madhab, the Shafi Madhab, the uh, Maliki Madhab, Imam Sunni from the Maliki Madhab, and the the Hanbali Madhab. And like we said to you before, mentioned a little bit within the Madhabs, does it mean that the Aqidah is Sunni as well? The four Sunni Madhabs, the Imams are Sunni. Their followers, some are Sunni, some are actually otherwise. So amongst the followers of the Hanif Hanifi school, there were a few Mu'tazilites, okay? Uh, and they actually quoted and their, their remarks on fiqh are accepted and they are fiqh scholars. But in terms of their beliefs, they, they may have been Mu'tazilites somewhat. Uh, in terms of the, the Hanbalis, they were quite well known that a lot of them were, uh, or a substantial amount of them were uh, anthropomorphists or literalists and, you know, and falsely attributed to Imam Ahmad. The actual Hanbali Madhab and him and his beliefs and the, the true followers of him both in Iqidah and fiqh were not literalists or anthropomorphists, they were orthodox, right? So sometimes, you know, this happens that the followers, although in fiqh might follow a particular imam in Akida, they might not. So there are two separate things, actions and beliefs. Um, so we ask God to give us both the actions following the sunnah, uh, the four Sunni schools, and also the beliefs according to the three Sunni schools or two Sunni schools of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ashari and Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. Um, and there's not really taqlid in that, so they don't, they don't say there's taqlid in uh, beliefs, they actually say that you should learn the proofs and understand your beliefs yourself and why you believe what we believe. And every Muslim should, and especially in this day and age of science and technology and and the, the amount of um, sort of uh, discourse that is in the media and ideas that are being shared and, you know, 
In the past, it was books, and the books had problems. They caused problems. People, ideas changed. Mu'tazila is an example of the first change of rationalization ideas and going to a quite a, a, a weird or you know an unknown kind of way of dealing with things, which was counteracted, right? Um, literalists were literalists. They were within the tradition, actually. And literalists were there already. Khawarij were literalists, in a sense. Um, and then now, later on, you had... Um, uh, um, technology so from writing went to technology and now technology has got even even more powerful as we see here uh, and a lot of ideas so i'm not just talking about, about kufr being shared or you know people doing anything bad against islam i'm just talking about just ideas being shared so you're picking up ideas on this philosophy that philosophy on on this idea they want to be, live like this they want to their, their life should be like this their worldview changes because of everything around us the globalization that we have so it's very important that as part of that we produce and we put forward and this is why i would really really encourage you to support um, Islamic organizations that are trying to produce scholars, that are trying to bring this Islamic discourse, trying to educate, trying to change the status quo of Muslims in Islamic intellectualism and, and, and learning, uh, and trying to up the ante, if you like. Um, we've got a substantial amount of basic classes and basic you know, stuff going on, but we need to I really push on the more um, uh, academic and advanced side of things, which is, alhamdulillah, we have, alhamdulillah, institutes and people doing this but they need your support you know so please support us at Deen al Fitra as well and you know we'll hopefully try and bring out more beneficial content um, that really addresses uh, the needs of our time as well as the basics as well as you know trying to uh, cover uh, various aspects of our religion as well as you can see this is very very foundational and important um, so yes yeah, so following in fiqh is fine following in Akida is not really required or no good it's just you believe so the ulama that defended our faith we follow them because they defended our faith so we can take the arguments and you know hopefully understand them if not we just present them and our faith has been defended and they could they continue to be ulama that, that carry that tradition on uh, the mutakallimin the you know the scholars of theology ilm al kalam it's a very very beautiful and rich tradition we have there uh, much has been written you know extensively and we have all the answers in our books it's a case of uh, acclimatizing those today tajdeed you know tajdeed is a part of religion not innovation, but renewal, you know, there'll be a renewal of the faith. A new, and that doesn't mean there's going to be anything new coming. It means there's just a acclimatization. There's a, a modern, you know, contemporary setting, you know, how people now think technology, you know, so forth, uh, uh, reaching to people's hearts in this day and age and, and techniques for that, um, whilst, you know, doing it fully in accordance with the Sharia and conveying the Sharia, right? So we need to do that more. We ask Allah to grant us and guide us to such people. Uh, and we ask Allah to allow us to help and support those who are trying to work for the deen. I mean, so the number, the fourth one here is rationally rationalizing customary associations, as this is the, the concept of Rabtul Adi. So to consider that the connection of cause to effect fire to burning is rational, is is a logical connection that it cannot separate. Iltizamun aqliyun. This connection, this sticking together, is uh, uns, in, uh, you know inseparable. So this is to establish a rational. If I switch over to that for you. Um, number four, rationalizing customary associations. This is to establish a rational connection between the two affairs by repetition, between any two affairs by repetition, whether they are occurrences or a lack of recurrence, whether, like we said, something happens or doesn't happen, but to consider this happens because of this, or this doesn't happen because of that, or a lack of that for a lack of this, whatever connection we give, whatever rob do we make, linkage we make, um, to think that is a logical, rational thing and not by the power of Allah, will lead to disbelief as we said right it could lead to disbelief and innovation um and this is people like the naturalists believe in mother nature as we said and also there is a concept here of uh, the naturalists or the, the those who believe in these natural things there, there's a so the philosophers come into this um i remember reading a book of mamu zali's iqtisad fil his um his uh, moderate moder, moderation in in beliefs iqtisad um, very good book. Um, I think it's been translated. Somebody said to me it's been a long time coming, but it's a very, very good book. It's an advanced book of theology. Um, when we started te reading this with one of our teachers, Sheikh Anas Shirfawi, he, um, Imam Ghazali, I think the book itself mentioned in the introduction, Imam Ghazali himself, we read about how the philosophers believe in the movement of the, the heavens, the heavenly bodies, and how these movements are all connected to what happens on the earth and creation and it's all natural basically right this idea of things occurring by na in nature there's a whole belief system regarding this you know i'm just saying with the nature to you and maybe you think it's just a word but that's actually a whole belief system 
uh, behind this uh, and, the, and the and this system believes or the people who follow it believe that there's a, a natural effect that theory you know there's actually a potency there an agency that does something um, in the world on the earth based on what's in the sky that, that is a belief in heavenly bodies having an effect on what goes on the earth um, and this would also so people who believe in these natural causes uh, and they link you know uh, or they, they link what happens to what something else that happens or lack of something happening one of those things is the fact that when somebody dies we've never seen anybody come back like it doesn't happen if it does it's a miracle right then miracles occur in these, these areas fire doesn't burn is a miracle so since we've not seen that i know i'm not seeing anybody come back alive i'm not going to deny i believe that we can of course become as part of our faith as part of foundations of our faith to believe in the well you know it's part of the articles of faith really the akhirah um, but you would it, it could lead and it does lead the naturalists the people who believe in uh, cause and effect being connected um, logically that once somebody dies we never see anybody come back so nobody can come back after death there's no such thing as resurrection or coming back to life or anything like that so in karul ba'th denial of a resurrection can occur from this right um, so this is and then there's no akhirat and belief in the akhirat disappears as well um, and all of all because of this false um, you know, illogical connection made between a cause and an effect, or a cause and its effect, um, or it's cause and effect. Sorry, yeah, not its effect. It's cause and effect. Um, or, or we know that um, some innovations have occurred amongst the Mu'tazilites, the Qadariyah, due to uh, making a you know an incorrect understanding of this connection, as well. Uh, and then we have number five, which will bring up, which is uh, compound ignorance, al jahl. Al Murakkab. Al Jahl al Murakkab is not knowing the truth. So to be ignorant of something. And I and I admit I'm ignorant of you know civil engineering. I'm ignorant of um you know certain scientific principles. You know, I'm not a scientist. I'm ignorant of these things. There's nothing wrong with that ignorance, by the way. Right? So the the basic that's not that simple ignorance, and every everybody's got that in certain areas, right? Uh, I'm not very good at you know a lot of things, right? So that doesn't it's not a blemish to have this simple lack of awareness, which you can call ignorance, um, of certain things. It's just life. We can't know everything, right? We know we can learn a lot and read a lot, but we can't know everything. So there'll be areas where we don't know. That's not a problem as long as we understand we don't know. That's not a, an issue whatsoever. That's normal for humans. However, the problem arises when we don't admit that we don't know things. So it says compound ignorance is not knowing the truth. And not only is he not admitting that you might know you don't know the truth. No, you're sort of oblivious of and, and totally unaware that you don't actually know. So it's a double ignorance, it's a compound ignorance. You don't know. La yadri wa la yadri annahu la yadri. <laughs> he doesn't know and he doesn't know that he doesn't know. Uh, this is a very, very and it's Imam Ghazali quotes this and he says you can't teach this person. Okay? So if people come to you with compound ignorance, don't waste your time with them. And this is something important when you want to help people or talk to people and you see conversations and debates and so forth, right? There's no point, there's no fruits in actually engaging with somebody who's got compound ignorance. This is one of the categories Imam Ghazali says, stay away from these people. Compound ignorance, not knowing, and not knowing that you don't know, would lead to loads of problems, um, loads of mistakes, um, and just to actually be quite, uh, uh, you know, fierce and quite you know um arrogant in your misunderstandings and uh deviancy right so um this is a very bad thing and it leads to other problems as well um because you know the person doesn't feel that, that, that they're in the wrong they don't feel the ignorance so why should they be wrong what i believe is correct i don't actually have anything wrong you know there's nothing wrong with what i do that's ignorance and a compound ignorance because you don't actually want to admit it. You're not letting your brain function, opening up your mind, as we say. You're not rationalizing. You're closing it up by just saying, you're, you know, I, I, I'm right. But you're, you're wrong. No, I'm right. The, the, look, one plus one equals two. No, I'm right. It's equal equals three. You're just being logical. No, no. Look, don't listen. You know, this is right. I, I believe the truth. That's just, that is actually ignorance. That's the blameworthy ignorance. If somebody does not want to change or learn or develop. And you'll find most people are not like that. Alhamdulillah. Most people who come to Islam, open their mind up, right? They actually think, and they think, well, let's open our minds up. And they look at other religions as well, I suppose, and they just research. And, you know, that open-mindedness, and we as Muslims should do that as well. Right? You know, we should look into our deen and, and our beliefs with open mind and try and understand things and not just blindly follow in everything, right? And certain things we should actually learn for ourselves. 
uh, especially aqidah uh, is really powerful it empowers you it empowers you to worship allah better and more and engage because you now understand that i'm a muslim and this is the truth and this is why i'm muslim and i should worship my god almighty he's the creator he, he's in control of everything and a lot and i really say a lot of issues you know these controversial things and all this that you know, they just disappear when you study especially aqidah and principles like this you think oh what, what, why are we arguing of this for just you know if you don't want to believe you don't want to do that then you know you fit in one of these categories right one of these forms of uh, bid'ah and stuff right you, you know you've learned the foundations and build on them you know inshallah ta'ala so yeah um al-jahl al-murakkab is a very very bad and negative uh, thing uh, the sixth element there is the observance to the doctrines of faith by observing or adhering uh, to the outer meanings of the quran and sunnah and without looking into the nuances of what is inconceivable in its outer purport meaning and what is conceivable right so this now is to adhere and stick with tamassuk right to observe the subjects of the faith you know holding strong to your faith what you believe with the outer zahir al kitabi wa sunnah um, without looking into um the actual meaning so it could lead to kufr this if you take something something absolutely literally and you actually believe it as it is and it's in the quran even and the sunnah it could lead to kufr right I'll give you an example allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um nasullaha fa nasiyahum they forgot allah so allah forgot them if i know that i only translate it literally to show you the meaning that's not the meaning of it right um allah allah forgot you know or they forget allah yes that's we can understand humans forgetting allah the kuffar i believe it's referring to but how can allah forget forgetfulness is a blemish forgetfulness man means you lose knowledge of something you're not aware of something really allah can be unaware of something of course not this is disbelief to believe that allah can lack knowledge in any way shape or form can 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 be unaware of something in his creation astaghfirullah you mean thinking about that is clearly obvious that it's wrong let, let, let alone go into any rational proofs but you've taken an eye of the quran and said i believe that because it's lit you've taken literally you not understood what's inconceivable for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what's rationally just not possible for the divine the the, the, the divine the creator and you've applied it there because it's literally in the Quran, right? We can't be literal in this case. We have to have to understand this differently. They forgot Allah, so Allah didn't care about them. He didn't. He didn't look. You know, he said, "Forget about him." And we don't forget about him. Literally, just don't bother pay any attention to him. They forgot Allah. They didn't pay attention to Allah. Allah didn't pay attention to them. He know. He knows everything about them. He's fully aware of what they're doing, but he's not giving his care, kindness, and forgiveness, and so forth. So it doesn't literally, literally mean forgetfulness. Allah doesn't forget. What it means is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to now turn to them in kindness and generosity in the same way he will to others. So he won't forget others. He will. So you see, in that sense, it's not a literal forget, right? Um, hopefully that makes sense to you. But this is the problem here. And other examples can be given of ayat of the Quran taken literally that make Allah into a body, for instance, or a, a, a substance, for instance. Um, you know, there is... Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I don't think it's a it's a Muslim group. Uh, anybody from Islam said this. I know I'm not sure, but the, the example is given sometimes in the books that Allah nurus samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And for to believe in that Allah is literally a light, whatever light you can imagine, that is disbelief because Allah is not a, a substance like light. No, He's not creation. A light is created, whatever form of light it is. So Allah is the illuminator he's one that gives light to the heavens and the earth you know he created the heavens and the earth he gives it its structure nur here doesn't mean he's literally a light uh, but i think there was um a, probably fire worshiping group or something like the magians or something like that majus they believed that um that light is one of the gods like this you know, light is a god basically um and obviously the, we, we have to understand light is contingent it's created it's transient it's hadith in arabic right it occurs it's not pre-eternal it's not light is not like that that is a creation uh, therefore it can't be allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we can't tell that literally allah is not a light in it in of itself he's the munawwir he's the illuminator he's the one that gives light he is the the creator of the heavens and the earth you know nur he has to be not a description of allah literally it's a description of allah we don't negate the attribute we have to understand it within the within what is conceivable not what is uh, what is necessary for Allah, not what is inconceivable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And of course, light changes things, and Allah has no change, right? You can't do that. Um, and light is like we said, temporal, Allah is pre eternal, it can't be like that. So, this is why you know we can't take this literally in the Quran and Sunnah. They may result in disbelief or, or misguidance as well. Um, you know, so this is something we need to be aware of. Um, and a lot of that comes through the we talked about the mutashabihat and people taking them literally or applying their meanings literally and then disguising that by saying Allah knows best or not like anything we know, um, but it's literal as well and so forth. Um, you know, where Allah SWT says, Lima uh, khalaqtu I created with my bi he says he has two hands, or Allah's got two hands now. Yadahu you know the Quran says his two hands are spread out. You know, what's going on here? Allah, literally God's got hands, yes, to feel Allah, right? Uh, it doesn't mean you deny the attribute that Allah has given himself or this description, but we have to explain it in a way that's not literally going to be the case, right? Don't apply these two hands to Allah, astaghfirullah, right? This is not the case at all. Um, Allah has not got these massive hands or anything like this. And anybody who believes that Allah has got physical massive hands has committed disbelief. Um, there are a group that say that and then they say, but not like the hands of anybody else. Allah has got hands, they use the word hands, but not like anybody else or anything else of creation. The scholars differed over these people and they said it's better not to call them kafir because they haven't attributed creation to Allah or like Allah to his creation but they're using words which the clear meaning of doesn't befit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we can't take it as outer we have to take it as a different meaning but they don't, they're don't. they not willing to do that they're willing to stick to the outer and saying it and saying it but then at the end you know, qualifying their statement with not like the creation in any way shape or form um, so that, that final statement has saved them from kufr uh, with innovation uh, to hold that uh, stick to the outer meaning without giving it any uh, we're, give, we're giving it a, a meaning that's um, not inconceivable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's necessary for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and by the way there are and this is a test from Allah somebody might ask but, you know you, wait a minute so there's ayat of the Quran and hadith that are problematic they cause this literal interpretation is going to be pro yeah this is I wouldn't say they're problematic I would say they're a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are ayat and hadith like this uh, and they call mushkil mushkil al-athar so there's hadith Imam, Imam Tahawi mushkil al-athar mushkilat in a hadith mushkil mushkil al-Quran right there are books written on this whole topic um, and it's called you know mushkilat al-Qurani -Qur al was sunnah or al-kitab was sunnah there's many and there's books written in volumes talking about these and it's a test from Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala uh, but nevertheless, we will we, we'll, we'll move on to the next one. And it says, um, ignorance regarding rational principles. Okay, so this is al-jahlu bil qawaid al-aqliya. Ignorance regarding al uh, hakam al-aqliya, which is, as mentioned there, this being the cognizance, the awareness, the knowledge of necessities, possibilities, and those things which are inconceivable. Likewise, ignorance of the Arabic tongue, which entails the disciplines of language, grammar, and rhetoric. Right. So likewise, um, not having knowledge of those things. Um, would also result in a very big amount of problems because people don't learn the basics of sound rational thought then they don't know what's mustahil, what's inconceivable, they don't know what's necessary they don't know what's possible or contingent and they therefore start asserting things or denying things and misunderstanding things could lead to innovation and can lead to can lead to uh, disbelief, right? So similarly not understanding the Arabic language and then in misinterpreting things can also lead to uh, disbelief as well. Um, so, you know, give an example of language, for instance, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَفَخْتُ uh, فِيهِ مِنْ ruhi, And I blew the spirit into him, into Adam al-Islam, from my soul. Min ruhi, Allah says, right, with the with the personal ya at the end, it's my soul. So, if you take that literally, it's more literal, but it's also language as well. Uh, the idafa here, language, you have annexation, possession, right, you have possession. Mine, what does it mean, mine? If you're looking at a human level, my soul is the thing inside me, right? Uh, it belongs to me. But if you look at it from a divine perspective, it's impossible, it's inconceivable, right, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have. A soul, he's not created being that he's got a soul inside of him, right? He's like got some kind of soul, like whatever the soul is, we don't actually know what the soul is, to be honest. But he's not created to need a soul, he's alive, he's he is God Almighty. So he didn't have a soul from himself, literally, that he blew into Adam al Islam or took and blew. 
or literally had a mouth and blue, right? So these are inconceivable things, right? So not knowing these basic uh, rules and, you know, logical deductions and, you know, just rational thought that Islam affirms, you know, we're not talking about things that, uh, there's no contradiction between rational thought and Islam and the Sharia, by the way, right? So this is all part and parcel of one thing. It's not two uh, mutually exclusive things that can't be, um, you know, reconciled. They, to- they totally can't uh, and are. Um, so because that's a problem, you know, we have to say there's no thing, such thing as a, a soul that is within Allah or Allah is within, has anything that's within Allah because Allah is not an object to be within. What it means is that this soul is from Allah Almighty, meaning it's not from anywhere else. Allah created Adam Islam directly and blew the soul into him directly. Kun fayakunai, and you know, however, we don't know how Allah creates this. Kun fayakun is an eye telling us that, look, it just happens, right? Uh, Allah wants it to be, it happens. There's no way we can describe that to you right now, let's say, or there's no description of how things are created, right? The modality is not known. Um, so we believe in that, yeah, so that's how we believe in the ayah. So we don't take it to that literal, literal meaning and, and you know, rule out all these other contradictions and inconceivable, inconceivable uh, um, ideas that, that develop forth from that, right? Um, so often just a simple word like min and fi can have a massive effect, the prepositions can have massive effects on our understanding of language and so forth. So learning Arabic is really, really important. And this is why there's a great scholar called Ibn Hisham al-Ansari, one of the greatest grammarians that ever lived, to be honest. Um, he wrote many books on grammar, many books on grammar. Qatar al-Nada, Shad al-Arf, Tawdih al-Masalik, Sharh al-Fi ibn Malik. And he wrote one of the, you know, magnum opuses, if you like, his magnum opus, one of the top, top books of Arabic grammar. Um, Kol Mughni al uh, That's the beginning of the title. The remainder, which means the sufficiency for the one who's uh, labib, reason, reason, the one person of reason, of intellect. But the remainder of the title is An Kutubil Aarib. We suffice him, the intelligent one, from the books of the the Aarib. The Aarib are the commentators on the Quran. So what happened with him was, he was asked, you know, you're such a great scholar of language. Why don't you write a book on the Quran, a tafsir on the Quran? That will really benefit people. And, you know, he's, Bismillah. He said, yes, I have done. Because what have you done? He goes, I wrote a book on grammar. Goes, Which book is this? He goes, I wrote Muni al-Labib. What's the book about? It's about Arabic words, Arabic huruf, particles. So he goes through, min, fi, ala, an, uh, inna, ka'anna, layta. Uh, you know, wa'u al-atuf, wa'u al-qasam. He goes through the huruf and he applies them to the Quran and classical Arabic language and poetry and so forth. And by studying that book, you know, for instance, he goes to hatta. He gives and he gives several meanings. He says hatta kind of this meaning of that meaning. Over ten meanings he gives for uh, for for instance for lam al-ta'li, lam or lam al-jar, half jar. The preposition he gives many many possible meanings of possession, of ikhtisas, of um, istihqaq, of uh, you know, tamlik. You know, this, you know, this means like possession of speciality of uh, 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 right. Lam can be used for having rights. This belongs to me. Hadali belongs to me, right? Or it's possession, or it's a specific. This specifically for him. Hadalahu is specifically for him. Or al masjid lil muslimin. Masjid lil muslimin doesn't belong to the Muslims. It's specifically for the Muslims. Right? It's for their special worship. So lam can have different meanings in language, and applying that to the Quran then impacts the meaning you understand or the meanings you can possibly take from the Quran. It's a very deep, deep study of language will lead to a, a much more fuller and deeper understanding of the Quran. And this is why I think every Muslim should aim to learn, uh, you know, the basic level is a few vocab, a vocab of the Quran, like basic words of the Quran. Uh, and to go further is to learn basic course on Arabic grammar, basic course on Arabic sort of sentences and structures, and then looking at the Quranic sentences that are simple and straightforward and thinking, ah, oh, that's basic Arabic there. And look, how, look how so much of the Quran is basically uh, simple sentences put together to produce an amazing book, right? So you can start understanding this language and the beauty of it and the Quran ultimately the goal by learning some basic Arabic. Of course, to get to the fuller, deeper meanings, the rhetoric, the syntax and all that is required, right? That's what it says there, not having that will result in. So the outer basic level of language is not doesn't qualify you to commentate on the Quran or become a scholar of the Quran or become somebody who knows the Quran. This is a problem for some of our brothers who maybe Arabic tongue is their mother tongue or they learn the Arabic tongue to a basic level. They think now all of a sudden they're mufassirun and they can commentate on the Quran. I understand it, but I've been doing all my life understanding it. You know, well, wait a minute. Do you know the rules of language? Have you studied? You know, it's not, it's not intrinsic in you to know all that. In the past, the Muslims, the, the Sahaba, it was their language. It was their mother tongue, the actual language of the Quran. 
and every meaning and every idea that we've now put into books or the scholars have put into books and we study in books they all it was it was part of their their makeup who they were they, they, these faculties they had by by intrinsically right by who they were whereas now the language of anybody who lives today is of, of arabic is not anywhere near that level like nowhere near that level at all like there's not even a comparison to be made it's so so far away um, unless you're taught in the classical way unless you're taught that language and you're brought up and you have a good uh, parenting or schooling or education then you may well pick up a high level of proficiency in this classical language the language of the quran which then does qualify you somewhat yes you know that's what scholars are they are qualified in language we've got specialists in language spent all their lives you know 30 40 50 years constantly learning teaching researching researching you know reflecting uh, and so forth and and, and and they have reached a very high level of understanding Allah bless them. So, a lack of understanding in these areas will produce problems. Okay, will produce uh, kufr, will produce bid'ah, and we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, to preserve us from this, right, and to keep us safe from this. And we'll conclude there today. So that's where we'll stop today. We'll continue from uh, the designation of existent beings and reciprocal possibilities next time, inshaAllah. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sabi jamaeen.